Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Bible study and episode review of Shady Oak Ministries. My name is Shady Oak, and today we'll be going over episode 9 of season 1 of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Bridal Gossip. Of course, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys can pull from a, you could tell from a pretty high vantage point that the moral of the story is basically going to be don't judge a book by its cover, all of that yada yada stuff that Mr. Poninator pointed out, but I want to emphasize really strictly on the point that these morals and these ideas and this basis of character that is being emphasized in this study, in this episode, was originally introduced by Jesus. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus spoke, taking his disciples aside, those who really wanted to hear what he had to say, not just the crowds tagging along for, say, a free meal or water into wine or anything that they would just see to spend the day outside, get drunk on Jesus, go home, not actually take away from the things that he was saying and teaching. He was giving this message, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, on what a Christian really looks like perfected before God. Now, this is not to say that we as Christians will always be these things. In fact, most Christians have come to call it the Beatitudes or the I'm Notitudes, because you look at these things, you compare them to yourself, something's missing. It doesn't match. But specifically on the character that is required of a perfect human being and the discernment and the wisdom and the interaction that you have with other people. Jesus was the perfect human being, and this was an analysis of his own character that we could learn from and try to emulate. And in emphasis to all of this, Jesus pointed out in chapter 7, verses 1 through 2, again, the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 through 2. If you want to follow along, you have a tab open. It's got a Bible app on it, or if you have a physical copy, even better, or if you don't, I'd be happy to read along. Just follow along with us as we go through in this study. Verse 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, taking all of this in as the fine detail point of what a perfect life does in discerning not only his motives, but the lives of others around them, he can recognize that your mouth, that little piece of flesh that can cause so much harm in someone's life. James did a whole chapter on it in his epistle concerning just all the destruction such a little piece of our body can do. It can ruin relationships. It can cost us a job. It can do more harm, just like it's just a small rudder that directs a boat such a huge vessel guided in its very direction by such a small little piece of wood. Well, likewise, Jesus was saying the way that you even view people, the way that you treat others, and how you express your take on them first face, how you judge people, how you assess their actions in comparison to yourself. A judgment is taking someone's deeds into action and what you feel they deserve and for it justice. It's getting what you deserve. So judgment is saying, according to my standards, you deserve this treatment. Well, putting all of this in the most simplest way possible, I want to, as the first point for you guys to take away from this, emphasize that Jesus was making the point that your mouth is like a mirror. Our mouths are mirrors. And going a little bit more into all of this, it not only reflects the things that are going on inside of us, but in the way that we take out, it shows other people who we really are. Now, we saw in the episode that the main six, or specifically everyone but Twilight, were in being introducing everyone in the main six, with the exception of Twilight, were getting to roll out the red carpet, or rather the isolationist pony zombie apocalypse approach and hiding everyone and locking the doors to a newcomer to their town, Zakora the Zebra. Now, Zakora was foreign in more ways than one. She had different culture. She had different appearance. She had a different genus in the equine bloodline. She was a zebra where they were ponies. She had stripes where they had just 
technicolor fur, but they saw her as different, and this was foreign to them. And it actually goes back and reminds me of this really interesting study and observation on the behavior of baby chickens. Probably not the first thing that you'd imagine I'd compare this to, but bear with me in that the term picky hens, I'm sure you've heard that around the dinner table, you eat like a bird, you're so picky. Well, hens are not the nicest of animals in that when there was a run to the litter or there was an oddball or a deformed member of their group, when the mother hen would lay the chicks and they would hatch and interact with each other, if there was anyone that deviated in any way from the norm, maybe one of their eyes were a little bit oddly positioned than the other, maybe there was a deformity, maybe they were bigger, maybe they were smaller, in any situation where they saw something different than what the majority was doing, that what they were, they viewed it as a threat, and they'd all gang up on that one oddball in the group and peck it to death. That's not nice social climate, but it's the same thing with us. Because for anyone among this group who is listening who has been to grade school or high school, you would know that you don't necessarily take away from the classrooms in everyday life and impact going home as much as you do the social standards and how we treat each other. Because when we turn, it's not pretty. Everything that was going on in these ponies' lives had continued like normal. And when something new was introduced, they hid. They reacted in fear, just like those chickens. Granted, not the violent approach. There's two responses during a time of panic, fight or flight. I'm glad they chose the former. But, yeesh. When we are in high school and grade school, we notice that we as human beings, these little incarnations of fallen human nature that are children, which I am still a member of, by the way, show us that the second point I want to emphasize, it shows us that we are most comfortable in our own little worlds. And just like we learn from our social, our, our social circles in classrooms and on recess, and the times we get breaks and the times that we just hang out with each other in the neighborhood, we tend to react to things exactly like we learn them and observe them, not only from those around us, but from the movies. We get so much information from that big glowing screen. It's just an encyclopedia. It's, if there was a movie on every single test that we'd take, most of us would probably pass. We recognize with Rainbow Dash, it wasn't exactly helpful that they put on plays. She learned in different ways. But if there was a way that we could describe things and make it into an entertaining and overwhelming format, we as Americans especially learn a lot from television. And if television... If the movies, if TV has taught me anything, I'd say the fifth, most important, the fifth most important rule that you'll ever learn in a movie is that the aliens are always the bad guys, unless the movie's by Disney. Then it's kind of up in the air. But taking that into mind, we say, I said that we are most comfortable, most comfortable in our own little worlds. And... Anyone who's foreign to the way that things are supposed to go, if we break the status quo, like High School Musical, I promise never to reference that again, we break the standard, it's like an alien invasion, and the standard that we learn from those movies without ending up everything exploding with lasers is they are dangerous until proven gentle. They are guilty until proven innocent. And we take that approach in our daily lives, just like the main six took this approach in meeting Zakora, who could have been a friendly neighbor. They separated at arm's length, or hooves length, so much so that they almost created an enemy. Now, this is the saddest part, is that no matter how illogical an approach or rationale can be, a crowd can carry any point. I remember watching this encyclopedia of information known as the television and taking this massive information in, I was encountered with the most unfortunate of interceptions, the commercials. And granted, when we are in school, we enjoy the breaks in between our times to learning, but in the TV, I guess it's the opposite. Anyway, 
when I was watching this commercial, it was for a phone company that was guaranteeing no delayed text calls. Verizon, I believe it was. And they were scheduling what was called a flash mob, where a group of people were getting together, just kind of hanging out in trench coats in any public square. Don't worry, this isn't going anywhere weird. And they'd, well, it is kind of, but not that way. They'd, at the same time, all schedule with each other and practice all at a specific hour. Down to the T of a minute and a second, they'd all in unison jump out and start doing these really advanced moves. And all together in unison, it was awe-inspiring because of such good coordination and them all doing this thing at once. It, it's just kind of like an eye-opener. This is pretty cool. But in this commercial, because of the point that they were trying to make and why their company was worth investing in, the guy didn't get the text until two seconds too late that, well... The flash mob had been delayed by a half hour. So instead of 3.30, it was supposed to be at 4. And he was the only one doing it. And he looked like an idiot. He was just making all these advanced gestures and stuff. You can't see me because this is audio. But I just imagine I look like an idiot. They were doing the same thing here because it's just like when one person is out in a crowd and they're just yelling their point. We say, it's kind of annoying. Why don't you tell them to stop? But if a whole crowd's outside yelling the same thing, it's not only loud, it's scary. Actually, in the book of Acts, when Paul was visiting the church, or actually the city that would soon uh, church have planted there in Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey, (laughs) they were sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and many people were coming to a relationship with him. But unfortunately, there was a big market in that town for the Temple of Diana, which whose worship I will not get into here, and the statue is really kind of weird, but it was the souvenir of its day. If you wanted to go and see one of the marvels of the ancient world, you'd want to get this idol, this statue of Diana, and all of the artists and sculptors and salesmen who were making a good bundle off of these things didn't want to lose their paycheck. And this truth that they're realizing that Jesus is a proven God, and he is a proven savior and that he's calling you out of this life of gods that never did anything for you anyway they gathered together in a small group relatively but just started shouting in the most public way possible great is diana of the ephesians a lot of people were confused but after continuing this for hours you could imagine the people were like i the people were like i guess this is what we're supposed to be doing so they kind of joined in and it literally said in the text Most of the people of the crowd didn't know what they were doing there. They were just shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And after hours of this, it was so much of a frenzy that they started to get violent. And they charged Paul and almost beat him to death. Scary. Frightening. It didn't matter how irrational the point was. Not a lot of people even knew why they were there, but they still went with the crowd because just like one person, unless you're Hulk Hogan, can't really lift a car very well, if eight people band together, it's not that hard. We've all seen that happen in the Simpsons movie. Those of you who know. Anyway. The sad thing is, these unfortunate frenzies and this carrying away to the crowd. Yes, those heathens obviously can be carried away by these sort of things, but I'm, I'm of the church. I, I have a relationship with Jesus. I wouldn't be subjected to such idiocy. Well, think again. Do you know an apostle by the name of Peter? Granted, not the best track record as far as a disciple goes. Denied Jesus three times. He was one of the two that betrayed Jesus verbally. Judas betraying Jesus for a bundle of money. Peter denying Jesus three times when confronted by a woman, a small one at that. It wasn't really an intimidating circle, unlike how it was presented in The Passion of the Christ. But everything that was happening that night, he kind of discounted, saying, I would die for you at the Passover. Two hours later, he was asleep when Jesus told him to pray. When Jesus had emphasized over and over again, saying, this is going to happen. I'm going to let this happen. This is the Father's will that this happens. It happens. And Peter says, Lord, should we strike with a sword? Draws a sword and tries to cut off one of the servant's ears or servant's heads. 
but unfortunately he was sleep deprived, so he, <laughs> he had just been waking up, so he missed and only cut off his ear. Jesus healed him and said, dude, I got 12 legions of angels waiting for me to snap my fingers. You think I need your help? This is supposed to happen. You need to trust me. Well, Peter blew it a lot. He was known as the disciple who could fit his own foot in his mouth, a lot like most of us, a lot like the main six we're doing right now. But they had this interesting meeting, which I think is so funny because it's a lot like the episode started with that little group meeting in Sugar Cube Corner. Paul and Peter, along with a majority of the original church founding fathers and major figures who were sharing the gospel throughout the world at the time. (laughs) Well, let me read it to you. You can feel free to follow along in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, which is again in Asia Minor, it's on the, the border of the Middle East, would be today on the corner between Turkey along the Mediterranean Sea. You can Feel free to look it up on your own time. It's probably called something different today. But Paul speaking, he said, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision, referring to the Jews. James was the apostle who was given charge over sharing to the people of Jerusalem which were majority Jews. And if there were people who were coming from Jerusalem, you could imagine they were Jewish. And according to Jewish customs, it was unclean to sit with Gentiles. It was unceremonious to eat, say, things we would know today like pork. Hebrew nationals is all beef because according to Jewish kosher dietary laws, they weren't, it was unclean to touch pigs. Now granted, because we know the germ theory today, we can understand why. They didn't know how to cook things to 160 degrees. It was either burnt, black, or somewhere in between. You'd have to have a pretty lucky guess to do that, and I don't think you want to contract worms or salmonella. But when the Bible says not to do something, it means don't hurt yourself. God knew about germs. He knew about disease, but the people of Israel didn't. That's why the Levitical law covers these things in great detail. And keeping all of this in mind, Peter was sitting with Gentiles who generally weren't as hygienic as Jews. So you don't want to sit next to them because God said, you kind of could pick up aerosols and it's not really going to smell that great either. Well, all those things had passed now that Jesus had come. And having put away the law, the law was meant to be a reminder to us that we aren't perfect. If I say, I've kept the law since a certain period in my life, you are still guilty in one part because one crime makes someone a criminal, right? It's not a good thing to make your righteousness based off of the law because the law only shows how wrong you are and how much you need a savior. It was set there by God to show you, you aren't this, just like Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, you aren't this, that's why you need me. Well, Peter was just as fine expressing his liberty in Christ and sharing with Gentiles, non-Jews, people who weren't circumcised, people who weren't set apart through a covenant by the promise that Abraham made to God and that he passed down through his family as a sign on his body that he would be not dedicated to the desires of his flesh but against the things of the Spirit and of God, which is the calling of all Christians. But fortunately, we aren't required to do anything of that sort, that it's in our heart that this thing's happened. Well... All of this having happened, a group of Jewish men came in with James, and Peter got scared. We've seen that word a lot, right? It's like we remember from the last study. We need to be careful in letting fear dominate us because it drove Peter to something that Jesus just couldn't stand. It was called hypocrisy. Saying one thing and living another way. And saying, yes, we have liberty in Christ. Oh, Jews, I better separate myself. Better follow the law, otherwise I don't look like a Christian. When he had just gotten through saying we don't need to keep the law to be Christians. Just like Paul was making this point, he literally got in his face. He picked up the mic. He was Twilight Sparkle in this circumstance and saying, Ooh, what are you scared of? The fact that she has a mohawk? She was born that way, dude. What's, what's wrong with you? Are, 
I'll just read it to you. He said, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not of the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed as Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Paul had to remind the apostle Peter, this guy had seen Jesus, this guy had been hanging out with Jesus, he had gotten hugs from Jesus, he was taught, embraced, and forgiven three times by Jesus. And he still needed reminding of a guy who wasn't even a part of the original 12 and had to have a very lightning enlightenment and revelation to the truth on the road to Damascus. You can read the book of Acts if you want to get more into that. I'm sure we'll be going over it in a study in the future. But Paul was being called to a very awkward situation just like Twilight was in being the only voice of reason. But like I said before, just like Peter was carried off with corruption out of fear, sometimes it's not always fear that motivates us to be carried away with people who aren't following after God because Jesus said good character is corrupted by bad company. Proverbs and Jesus said this both. And keeping that in mind, recognize twilight never necessarily joined first face in accusing Zechora. She was kind of the voice of reason. She was kind of the Christian in the group where everyone else is in the room taking drugs and stuff. But would you notice she never left? She never separated herself from that situation and allowed the proximity to this weed to give her the munchies and leave high, even though she never picked up a joint. Because it was the same ground that the other pony stood on in accusing Zakora and calling her a hex and calling her a foreigner and calling her dangerous when she had done nothing of the sort. Twilight stood with them, and even if she wasn't among the voices mocking her, the poison joke was still the ground she was standing on. Hypocrisy and irony always go hand in hand, because I'm sure that Zakora was a bit strange to them, something worth getting used to. I'm sure a lot of you have met people that you weren't used to meeting, that had traits that weren't familiar to you. But just like with the main six, do you notice it was funny? They became the weird ones by calling someone else weird. Your mouth is a mirror. It's not who other people are that defines them based off of what you say. But catch this. It's what you call, say, and think about other people that reveals who you really are. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And keeping all of that in mind, Jesus was speaking to a group of people who were living this hypocritical, not, not the doctor's oath, but living one way and actually being someone else on the inside, believing that they were all right, but actually living ways that weren't. And Jesus called them out and said, bad trees can't produce good fruit and vice versa. If you want to be good, you have to be, if you want to do good, you have to be good. And guess what? You aren't good. And guess what? I'm not good. And guess what? You aren't good either. And that's the funny thing is when we realize we as human beings do these things by nature. We are picky hens. We are the hypocrite. We are called to live comfortably in our own worlds. What's the solution? Well, would you notice the funniest part about the entire episode, I felt, was just like they could have solved the solution to their irony, their ironic punishment, the poison joke, was a book that Twilight overlooked as superstition, as old, as something that isn't relevant to them today something that just couldn't be applied to help them when it was the one thing that she overlooked that they needed. 
in changing your life and heart, I'm sure a lot of you have gone to self-help. You guys are seeing counselors. You guys may be even taking pills for it. But what's the one book that you guys are overlooking and how to be called to a new life? Isn't that fun? You guys don't have the Bible. It may seem like an old book, but its truths are relevant to you this day. If you guys read this thing and you watch the show, you can see it in new lights that will just bring a smile to your face and recognizing, man, Jesus knew what he was talking about. He was talking to the world before he even was born. Or at least when he stepped in physically, he always was. That's the best part. Is that he has a plan for your life and says everything he has in store for you is good, even when it is hard right now. And you can trust a guy like that. You can have a relationship with a guy like that. And you can live forever with a guy like that. But the funny thing is, it's always the last option we turn to, just like Twilight's book. Just like the one thing that could cure all their problems in an instant, they seem to overlook until the last minute. And I pray that that is none of you. That just like you want to be able to be the decent person in the group that welcomes Zakora in and be the friendly neighbor and gives them an opportunity, as James 1.19 says in saying, Brethren, be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to wrath. You have two ears, one mouth, use accordingly. Is that what that means? But not only living practically, but having the right heart about it and not doing the right things because it's the right thing, but doing it because it is the right thing and you have someone in your life and heart guiding you who is the right one. If you want a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is say, I am a sinner. I don't have these things, but Jesus, I want you. I want your heart. I want you in me. I want to turn from my old life and start following you in faith. Please forgive me and come into my heart as Lord and Savior. In your name, amen, which means truly let it be so. It is that simple. And I'm sure that cure to poison joke wasn't too far into the book either. You allow this book, this Bible, these basic instructions before leaving earth to solve the one problem that we all have, and that's that our lives aren't forever. You invest in eternity and take the side that will win. I guarantee you, it won't return void. God's word never returns void. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for listening to this message. I hope you guys were blessed by it. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave them in the comments below. And God bless you.